Well, uh, we'll get started. Welcome, everybody, uh, for the Drexel 125 lecture series. Uh, I am not Dr. Scott Knowles. He senses regrets for not being able to be here today. Um, so I'm his surrogate, uh, Kevin Egan. Um, he's my former boss, so I still heed the call when he comes calling. Um, very excited to uh, introduce our speaker for today, uh, especially since my office is graciously situated in the library, so I'm always very appreciative, uh, appreciative of uh, her collegiality. Uh, Dr. Daduna Nateki is a professor and dean of libraries at Drexel University. Dr. Nateki's professional experience includes administrative positions in large academic research libraries, publishing and teaching in both classroom settings, as well as online professional development programs. Prior to coming to Drexel, she held positions in libraries of the universities of Tennessee, Illinois, Maryland, and Yale. She's a very active as a researcher with too many publications to list for you today, uh, but in 2010, she won an award for the best book in library literature from the Greenwood Publishing Group, American Library Association. Dean Natecki holds a PhD from University of Maryland College Park in Library and Information Science, an MS in Communications from Tennessee, and an MS in Library Science from Drexel. She's known across Drexel's campus by students and colleagues as an innovator in creating integrated learning spaces, as well as being the kind of colleague we all look to for advice and collaboration. Dean Nitecki wrote a chapter for the book, Building Drexel, and that is the topic of her talk today. Please join me in welcoming Danuta Nitecki. All right, thank you very much. So since this is a class, and I've sat in on several of these, can you all hear me pretty well? Um, I'll assume at least some of you read the chapter in the textbook, uh, and I won't embarrass you to say who, though I know one now in the front row did. Uh, and thus, I'm going to avoid the temptation to simply rehash what I wrote there as a lecture. Instead, I invite you during this mini seminar hour to engage with me in thinking about what defines a library at Drexel. So I propose we do so from a shared historic perspective, as well as from some current expectations we each have for the value a library provides to us individually, whether for learning, teaching, research, mental escape, intellectual curiosity, you fill in the purpose why this question might be of interest to you. Let's see where this exploration leads us in imagining an outstanding Drexel library for the first part of the century and suggesting what to do to get there. <clears throat> So a word about my motivation perspectives. So eight years ago, I was asked to redefine the academic library by a provost who was recruiting me to head the libraries at Drexel. I accepted the challenge and came back to Drexel in 2010 after having received, as uh, Kevin mentioned, my master's degree here about, uh, well, we'll say almost 40 years ago. Between these two residencies on campus, I developed my view of the academic library through working in managerial and administrative positions in these various research, very large research universities, as well as through the various activities that uh, um, has been bragged about by Egan. So by a show of hand, let's, let me get a sense of your relationship to the libraries. So who among you are undergraduate students? Okay, the vast majority. How about faculty? Graduate students? How about researchers? Readers? Oh, good. We got uh, <laughs> constant seekers of information. Oh, it's interesting that not all of you would think of yourselves that way. Okay, who's been to the Drexel Library today? Oh, not bad, about a third of you. How about this month? Better. How about this quarter? <laughs> all right, how about never? <laughs> Admit it. <laughs> Well, that's good. All of you have it at least once. Other than stepping foot inside a library building, who's opened the library.drexel.edu uh, library website uh, this academic year? Okay, many of you have. And has anyone read an article or book online that was free once you logged in as a Drexel employer or student? Okay, so you've been to the library in different ways. Has anyone talked or chatted online with a librarian, two of whom are sitting in the back there? Oh, only one of you. We got a problem here, guys. <laughs> or consulted perhaps a guide from an online course shell, library guide? Hmm. So 125 years ago, some of these activities would not have been possible. Well, perhaps surprisingly, many were established from day one of our university's history. So 
let me see how I'm going. I guess I use this. All right, so for hundreds of years, since at least the 15th century, the word library has communicated a fairly consistent meaning. Its origins are from late medieval English via Old French from the Latin libraria, meaning bookshop, or of librarius, relating to books, from libra, liber, the root cause of the word book. So perhaps another more meaningful context for you may be, may be that the word library is a Scrabble word with, guess how many points? A dozen, 12 points if you're a Scrabble player. So if you look at, uh, if you take a Google, Google search powered by Oxford Dictionary to find, to find out what is a library, there's a number of definitions are posted, but carry three common characteristics of a library. A place, an organized collection of books and other formats, and people who interact with these information sources. All right, first little pop quiz. So where was the first Drexel University Library? And uh, let's start by seeing, you know, one of these visual uh, browsable questions. <laughs> Do you know what these four buildings are? Somebody yell out, what is A? No one knows the upper left what, what the building A is? I hear it in the back. The Academy of Natural History, yes. How about B to the right? Anybody know what that is? Main building. How about C? Corman and D, the Hagerty Library. Okay, so which one of these, there's the big hint, I've narrowed all the buildings down on campus and places that maybe have been torn down. Where was the first Drexel University Library located? Which one? A, A well, at the time, that wasn't part of the, the university though. I'm saying they're really the first place. I'm sorry? I am, Kari. I'm saying the, from the beginning of the history of Drexel University, what is, where was the first Drexel Library? It has to be B, because that's the only building that's that old, right? Well, but it could have been that we didn't start till then. We didn't start till then. All right. He's right. He gets the prize. I was going to bring some things to throw at you, so you get, visually, you get on those ducks, but good. <laughs> so, it is indeed the old building. So the library is one of the oldest continuing departments on campus, opened as a room in the, main in the main building with the start of the Drexel Institute. Back there in 1892, these pictures are from 1892. And it was there to house collections. And by the way, these are photos from our archives. Uh, and a place uh, to house collections continued. You can see more how that's done with shelving at the, uh, the beginning of the century and also for readers, for students, and if you notice, both women and men uh, were users. In the 1930s, several triangle articles described facility changes to increase use and circulation of books, including a men's lounge and a dormitory library for use by female students. Reports in 1931-32 indicated that as many books circulated in one month as did in an entire school year the decade before. The library was growing as a place for seeking and using information resources. Crowdedness, however, continues throughout the history of this library, with several library administrators, all 125 years, advocating for additional space. But the library room in Maine remained the campus library for over six decades, well into almost 1960. By June of 1956, President James Creese, so you probably recognize the name from Creese Hall, announced the groundbreaking for a five-story, 7,000-square-foot new library. In the following year, librarian Harry Dewey noted that, quote, the most important distinction between the concept of librarianship today and that of 100 years ago is the modern idea of service to readers as against the old idea of the library as a storehouse of books. However, I think he was, he was going back into, well into the 19th century. Drexel's library really started with the idea of service. So does anyone recognize the building which fully opened in 1959 as the first dedicated library building on campus? Don't let the old cars throw you. <laughs> Anybody recognize this building? It is currently the Carmen Building, 
And actually, I hate to admit it, this was the library when I was here as a student. And I, this, this morning when I looked at it, that's the view I have. So this picture was taken from across the street uh, in my office, which is on uh, 33rd Street. So there used to be a street going there. But within a few years of its building, faculty were complaining of overcrowding to which the library director, then Robert Johnson, admitted, and I quote, we're just about reached the building's capacity in seating students with unexpected increased enrollment of library science students. Triangle articles over the next several years complained of noise, broken equipment, and a desire for more study rooms and extended hours. Expectations were expressed to, quote, provide the student body with the proper facility and atmosphere for studying. By 1973, predictions for a new library building were announced, motivated by the Middle States accreditation recognition that it provided inadequate support for PhD programs. Remember, this was at the time the institute was aiming to become a university. It's interesting when you go into some of the literature and the reports that directors had, for many years they're saying it's just not enough room, but it took an accreditation report in both of these buildings to, to uh, have another facility built. And within five years of when the WWH Hagerty, W.W. Hagerty Library opened in 1983, UPenn librarians down the street were complaining of too many Drexel students using their library. And as the university faced grave financial challenges in, uh, slightly after that period, in 1991 editorials, a number of them in the Triangle, listed evidence of the library's decline, such as a discontinued article copy service, cuts in journal subscriptions, inter-holiday closure and reduction of science reference staff. And in 1992, library director Eileen Hitchingham characterized the Hagerty building as, quote, deteriorating around us. And actually, I love this picture because it really, I've heard about these trees, and maybe some of you were here when, I don't know, Mike, if you were here when this was happening, or, or Eric, but you know, one of these FICA trees just grew so big, you couldn't move it, it had to be literally cut down. But it's still, the basic core of the building is there. So technology-based services and equipment began to appear over the last quarter of the 20th century, as proudly posed here by director Eileen Hitchingham in the early 1990s. So earlier in 1976, the library offered Dialog, which is a fee-based computer-assisted bibliographic search service. And just as a personal note, what this replaced, because one of my first professional jobs as director of the library in Tennessee said, there's this whole service you can approach where you work with a client and figure out what their needs are, you write them down as a series of steps, and you ship it by mail to these centers that at night with mainframes would chuck out bibliographies. And just as I was doing all this research to figure out, you know, where are these places in, in Georgia, in North Carolina, and the like, Dialog, which is a major group, announced this really revolutionary thing to do it at a computer by yourself with it. So automation was starting to be really a major uh, provider of support and services. We had CD-ROM for business indexes and journals were offered in 1987, and a new automated catalog system went online in spring of 1993. Now, this is interesting. Spring of 1993, a catalog, online catalog system. But that was after nearly 20 years of planning, an introduction of public and automatic access to the holdings of the library at many other universities. And again, that was a big moment in our history. So let's take the historic evolution of the library facilities. Uh, let's leave that for the moment, since we have reached the presence of the current W.W. W. Hagerty Library which incidentally was named after uh, one of our really innovative presidents uh, whose, whose 100th anniversary we celebrated last year. So this opened 34 years ago and not vastly, it hasn't vastly changed since then except for a dedication of its top floor to the establishment and accreditation of the law school. And to turn to the second major, let's instead turn to, turn to the second major defining characteristic of a library and that being the collections. So to do so, let me introduce you to Alice B. Kroger. Anyone know who she was? Yeah. Ah, do you remember as being, are you a library science student? No, I'm a library science Ah, good. Was well, there something else that she did before she founded library school? OK. 
okay, it's to do it. And she was the first librarian. All right, I actually, I'm sort of taken by her as I read a little bit more on her. So she was a student of the renowned Melville Dewey, who is known especially for his development of the decimal classification system used by libraries all over the world to organize their collections by subject. And particularly public libraries have continued this tradition even to today. And here's the thing, at the age of 27, she founded the library in 1891, making it one of the oldest and longest continuing departments at Drexel. A year later, as he mentioned, she founded the country's third library school, and it continued to be administered by the libraries until the 1960s. Kroger brought innovative ideas to Drexel and directed both the library and this professional training program for library workers until her sudden death in 1909 at the age of 45. During its first year, the Department of the Library and Reading Room, as it was known, which has built and organized a collection of nearly 8,000 volumes of books, periodicals, manuscripts, photographs, and slides that Kroger accomplished uh, primarily through gifts and donations from our founder, Anthony J. Drexel, and his business partner, George W. Childs. Now, just to put this in perspective, does anybody want to make a wild guess how, many, how large our collection is today? 8,000 items. How, is that a big collection, small collection, but you brought it together in one year? How about our librarians? You ever want to take a guess? Jay? <laughs> We're about 600,000. That's counting electronic resources. So give or take physically, we're about 400, 450,000, somewhere in that range. So, and we are not one of the huge academic libraries. When you talk about some of the large ones, you're talking in the millions. But it's rather impressive. In one year, she would have collected 8,000. I think right now we catalog and in, collect physically maybe 10 to 15,000 because things have changed. So it's pretty impressive. So Kruger, too, uh, Alice, she was a cataloging specialist and a member of the American Library Association, which is our primary professional group, and as you can tell, has a long history. They had a cataloging rules committee. This was established in 1901 to create the first code of rules for cataloging. You know, this, all this stuff that you learn about how to describe something, what's the title, what's an author, didn't, didn't just come out of nowhere. So this was, she was quite involved in them. Um, and this later helped the Library of Congress to become the agency to distribute printed catalog cards. Now I had in my, <laughs> my career, no, this is not me, um, an experience where I was in another library with their huge card catalog cards like this built in, and this young person with his her parents were walking by and looked totally lost, and I said, can I help you? And she said, what is this stuff? And that was the first time, sorry, unfortunately it was a few years ago, I was thinking, feeling in my stomach that here's a generation that knows nothing about this. So I suspect none of you have ever dealt with card catalogs. So let me tell you a little bit about that setting. So imagine the revolution that the introduction of an online catalog in the mid-1970s had on access to collections. For decades, catalogers have created what we call a bibliographic record, which describes the physical book, journal, and other items that comprise a library collection. At first, <laughs> this is uh, Alice calling to tell us we had something wrong. <laughs> um, at first, each item would have cards formatted with these descriptive information, such as a title, author, subject headings, and they were filed in wooden cabinet drawers. And these were held down by a metal rod through the three by five cards for people to search and identify call numbers, as you see here in the upper left. Then those, in turn, were used to locate the item on physical shelves. Once automated, both the production of these cards and the retrieval of such information really seemed instant. So application of automation soon went beyond changing library workflows to change the nature of content itself. About the same time in 1971, a guy named Michael Hart uh, had the opportunity to use $100 million worth of computer time on a Xerox Six Sigma 5 mainframe at the Material Research Lab at the University of Illinois. He decided that the value of computers would be less computing and more the storage, retrieval, and searching of what is stored in libraries. He typed in the Declaration of Independence and tried to send it to everyone on the network, 
This is commonly thought to be the first posting of an electronic document which led to the birth of Project Gutenberg, with the premise that anything that can be entered into a computer can be rep reproduced indefinitely. And I just added this little signo because darn it if Drexel's not there with the dragon, right? Or so I'll, I'll claim that's a dragon. Also guiding this project were some other principles that Gutenberg e-texts should cost so little that no one would really care how much they cost, and also e-texts should be so easily used that no one should ever have to care about how to use, read, quote, and search them. The role of the librarians to provide access to information and to guide people in its discovery and use changed forever as well. So other projects, most notably the Google Library Project, implemented a vision that the largest academic library collections would be scanned and be electronically retrievable. Not just their bibliographic citations, but the full text as well. So the success as of fall 2015 was the availability of over 25 million titles. So keep that in mind compared to Alice's probably gathered 8,000. Google has become synonymous to the complex and powerful search engines used to complete full text searches and multiple access points. Alice Kroger likely would not have been able to even imagine this new approach of accessing collections and reading them through handheld devices and movable furnishings that many of us today could not imagine not having. So last year alone at Drexel, over four million online searches resulted in over two million downloads of full text materials. This compares to the circulation of approximately 150,000 physical books as well as equipment. We do about 34,000 of that 150 is laptops and other materials that you want to use to be able to read. So to accommodate the change in how people seek and use information dramatically changed how libraries build their collections. At Drexel now, more than 25% of the library's acquisition budget, which traditionally was used to accumulate physical copies of books and journals that required people to come to them, to that item, now is expended on licensing access to publications and databases for retrieval anywhere there is a network connectivity. So no longer is there one reader at a time for one book, but multiple readers to access items from multiple locations. We less often own a book, but rather ensure that our community may read it for no cost through a personal device. The library's budget for providing this convenience is now approximately $5 million annually, well below what most research library standards, but it is supplemented by resource sharing arrangements to retrieve and deliver needed publications through arrangements with other institutions. So the third common characteristic of a library is its users who come at the intersection of the library space and its collections. The Drexel Library, shown here in 1892, was built already with one eye to the modern concept of a place to read. Drexel librarians also had strong commitments, and still do, to serving users, from simplifying their access to materials through circulation, reserve services, and interlibrary loan, to group instruction and personal consultations in how to navigate the information landscape. Such guidance earlier was linked to the library building and was known as library instruction. That showed how to find books and journals to physically locate and needed reading materials. But over time, this educational role has focused more on helping learners develop information literacy skills that range from identifying a need for information, effectively identifying what sources meet that need, evaluating the relevance and authority of the findings, and then utilizing information as a basis for critical thinking with respect for the ethical use and acknowledgement of intellectual property rights of others. Drexel never has had a huge library collection. As I said, we remained under a million physical items throughout our history, for which in many places the space has to be devoted to shelving re reading materials. But in the last 20 years, many libraries are removing shelving to add seating, and we find renovation and building investments that redefine libraries as learning or information commons with settings to study alone, in groups, and in the company of others. As availability of electronic information resources was lessening the need for users to physically come to a library building to be that one-at-a-time user of a book, some began questioning the need for a library. 
In a 2005 profile of the dynamic and provocative Drexel President Papadakis, the Wall Street Journal reported that he was, quote, averse to raising the library budget to buy books and build buildings to house them. He admitted elsewhere that this was exaggerated his statement to make a point and question what the future of the library should be. So today's question is a continuation of the one he asked. The same year, he issued a letter, which was found in the archives, however, that endorsed very enthusiastically the work of the Drexel Library Dean. The Dean of the Libraries at the turn of the 21st century, Carol Montgomery, was credited by the president with leading the library's fast-track migration to an electronic journal collection, as he quotes, and as he notes, quote, our electronic library initiative met with some resistance, but the initial challenges had been eclipsed by the benefits, both academic and financial. The timeliness of library services has increased, and Drexel has been able to offer library resources to geographically scattered students on our two new health sciences campuses and in our online courses. Each year, college students and faculty become more technologically savvy, and their expectations for information services increase. Because of our early commitment to electronic holdings, he notes, Drexel is well positioned to meet the needs of this wired population in the years to come. So soon after I came to Drexel in 2010, President Fry also came and mounted a highly engaging strategic planning process for which I conducted a future search retreat to identify how the libraries can advance the university's mission. From this very engaging two and a half day retreat of over 60 stakeholders, including students, faculty, administrators, information specialists, and external friends, four strategic directions were articulated to guide staff for our 2012 to 2015 strategic plan. Library staff have focused on four strategic directions, to ensure access to authoritative information, to build learning environments in physical and cyber spaces, to strengthen Drexel's connections to scholarship, and to model an effective and data-driven organization that focuses on clients. To ensure access, we have improved cataloging with more effective metadata applications, introduced a discovery system such as summons to make searching more convenient and thorough, and extended professional practices for curating archives and managing the university's records. Every year, we've gathered data, especially from students, on what could help build the library as a learning environment and also executed a small prize to develop ways to capture visual data as evidence of how students utilize the space for learning. One outcome was the building of the library learning terrace. How many of you have used that? It's been around a bit. Yes, yeah, so you're from, it's up in the upper left here. Uh, an early dedicated collaborative informal learning environment where students take ownership of their, their own space for learning. Another has been the introduction of the data visualization zone, zone on the top right here for anyone to explore how to discover and relate data to form new insights. We have also accomplished small renovations in both the W.W. Hagerty Library and the Hahnemann Library with gift funds and have a thoughtful plan to complete the Hagerty Library renovation in coming years. The libraries has helped strengthen Drexel's connections to scholarship by inventing information literacy in the curriculum through partnerships with the faculty. We also have assisted faculty in contributing profiles of their accomplishments to establish an authorita authoritative database of the university's academic assets from, its, from the faculty. The quarterly scholarships program and more recently scholar snacks for students have offered social venues for faculty as well as students to share research experiences with peers in other disciplines. As an organization, we evolved a matrix style of management added numerous areas of expertise, including a librarian for undergraduate learning, constantly seek client feedback, and offer personal librarians for every entering student. So this fall and winter, we've been revisiting our strategic plan to refresh our directions for the next five years. We've articulated our business more simply and our playing field. To be the locus of expertise and innovation regarding scholarly information, how to find it, and how to use it. The draft plan today links our initiatives with the university's ambitions and emphasizes three major objectives for the library. First, it contained the cost of higher education by stewarding the university's investments, as I mentioned, it's around five million, with staff and equipment, seven million, 
to ensure access to scholarly communications at rates of high return. And we've, we've estimated that we do this at a one to 10 uh, margin. So in other words, the alternative if we didn't do this for you to get the same volume of access, the street value would be 10 times what we're paying right now. Secondly, to enhance student self-directed development. Research shows that the best student work is in formal learning environments designed to focus, prepare for work, and become lifelong learners. And we're creating environments to enhance that development in the context of exploring information and increasingly data. Third, we're shaping future scholarship. By making Drexel-generated research data and publication outputs more easily discoverable and available, we're raising the metrics of counts and impact factors to raise the visibility of Drexel's research and contributions to scholarship. But these edits are still rather for a short-term future when we think about 125 years, right? It's only five years. And so now I invite you to try to imagine what may be happening to, to life further into the future, whether from your own experiences or maybe let's put on your sci-fi sci imagination and gear. You represent the clients of the library's services and resources. You seek information very differently than I did when I was here before. You vocalized expectations for space that provide focus and for librarians to guide and not preach are placing, all of these are placing very different demands on the library. So we try to understand your perspectives. We have online surveys, we conduct interviews, we, observe, we have observational reviews. But let's hear what you, th what you see and think as I leave the remaining time for discussion with a couple of triggers. So will students who are new to campus in 2020, will they seek library spaces? And if so, for what or why not? Will the consumer of information become also the producer and, and turn static library contact to be dynamic? What about collections? For how long will there be need for librarians to license access to publications with all that's available for free? Where do you find information? And are you con confident to gauge if what you find is not fake in today's lingo and worth using? Explorations of the future granted hypothetical possibilities that the cerebral cortex of the human brain might be seamlessly, safely, and securely connected with the cloud as a brain cloud interface. How might that affect the way we seek the information? Our current research is underway, and actually some here on campus, on using the brain as a passive input to adaptive interfaces using functional near-infrared spectroscopy. Others are designing a system that would enable computers to directly monitor your brain as you work, responding to your needs in real time. The system uses a headset that beams infrared light from amateurs on the user's forehead, or you know, we have this uh, band now that uh, some of our colleagues are developing, into their prefrontal cortex. Part of the brain is associated with planning and decision making. So by measuring the amount of light reaching uh, receivers on the forehead, the system can determine when a user is concentrating or not. Then matching the readings to what a user is looking for on the screen allows the system to decide what information is useful. Computers will soon learn to predict what enables, for example, what emails, for example, are important and what are not. Then the system could determine when someone is busy and only interrupt them if an incoming piece of information is deemed important. The research may certainly radically change the way our society works. So for a placeholder, fast forward to 2025. Will Drexel need a library? And how will it advance the university's mission then? So what is most important to do during the next five years to prepare for that uh, year of, just as a place for the first quarter of the century? So what are your thoughts? Yeah. And if you could speak loud so that people can hear you. Okay, so you're saying that, uh, what's your name? Daniel. Daniel. So Daniel is suggesting that it's very hard to imagine not having a library. Well, with such a long history, it certainly is. But on the other hand, as you say, it would be different. So what would be different about it? And why would we need the library? What are, what are some of the things that are happening that maybe, you know, change pretty drastically?
So, Daniel, I don't know if people in the back can hear him. So you're going to have to maybe step up and turn that way, too. It's project your voice. Or come and use this mic. You know, I, I think we can do that. But he's suggesting that librarians' ability to help interpret what is found may be important. But, you know, are you going to even be, I don't think any of you, or maybe one or two only raised their hand that you've ever talked to or chatted this academic year with a librarian. So, you know. Talked or do it online. Yeah, chatted or talked, either one. So how many of you have talked in person? Maybe that was the... Okay, so we get four, five, six. <laughs> Going for seven out of a whole room full. <laughs> okay. So you still think there's a need for some sort of expertise that helps you determine what you've found. Okay, are you always going to have that near you? Once you graduate? You're a good optimist about the need for our public libraries. And I would certainly, I don't want to sound uh, negative on this, but our last uh, mayor, and he admitted it was his fatal mistake <laughs> in his term, he reduced, the pri he reduced the budget of the public library system, which, by the way, the Free Library of Philadelphia is about the 11th largest in the country, uh, managed by a really dynamic director, um, which resulted in closing a lot of neighborhood libraries. There was such an uproar. He had to reinstate that. Look at our school library systems just in Philadelphia. There's 200 public schools right now in the city, of which we're down to only six librarians to meet that, even though there are statewide um, requirements and way to have aspects to support the students that are still coming up, or the new citizens, our new residents, our colleagues that are growing up in the city, to have that kind of support you're talking about. So it's not going to be just a complete given. Libraries are not totally apple pie and motherhood, you know. It's have to make a point. Why? Why would, why would we have it? And the, and the school system is an interesting example. Not something I know much about, but I've been asked to, to give it some thought lately. And it's a very tough decision put to a principal. She has a limited or he has a limited amount of resources. Do I hire a librarian? Do I hire a math teacher? Do I hire a nurse, which is also required? How do you how do you stretch out limited resources? So how how do the others of you see that future? Yeah, Eric. I would I would challenge everybody in this room to think about why it is that you go to the university in the first place. Mm -hmm. well, why are you here? You know, is it because of Starbucks tax fees, or is it here because for the past five hundred years universities were about creating Absolutely. I was thinking about it maybe not in terms of management but also meaning making that has gone from cat cataloging and categorizing information to help making that information meaningful and useful to the students and the researchers. Since this the the underpinning of the book when Scott Knowles and uh, Richard Dilworth did it was not just to look at our history, but also think about the university in the city. And so, since I have the time, I realized I left this on my screen, so let me go forward a little bit. I was trying to look at, you know, what were libraries like in the period? <clears throat> and this city is rich in the foundations of libraries. The library company, am, am, are any of you familiar with it? It's 
the movie, yes. All right. So it was founded by Benjamin Franklin. You know, one of those good guesses, <laughs> or somebody else, right? In 1731. And, he, and this was the first circulating library in America. They discovered that uh, the far-ranging conversations and in the way what Eric's talking about, uh, about intellectual and political themes were floundering at the times. In 1731, this is, you know, before his, uh, the hot topics of becoming a country, becoming, you know, s staying loyal to Britain or not. So it was floundering at a point that, um, that facts that they felt could be found in a decent library, but there weren't such libraries easily. Most people in colonial Pennsylvania, you know, only the really well-to-do could have books that they brought back from, from England. So this library group, um, uh, what, what um, Benjamin Franklin did, he had some of his friends get together, and they started bringing books and purchasing and bringing them together so they could be shared by everybody. So it became sort of the first circulating public library. And that was, again, an underpinning, as Eric's saying, to be able to get the facts, to get the ideas, to stimulate your thought, and really develop your intellect, your ability to start using critical thinking and use based on information. So it's a very interesting piece of it. And I can show you this other one. So when you're thinking, what were libraries like? I try to see what else was around. So just down the street, and you can go see it on Penn's campus. Also, for uh, Furness, who also is the architect who made our, which building? Does anybody know? No architect students. <laughs> Alumni Center, yeah, which used to be a bank, which is a very nice building. So he built, just around the same time that we were going, the first library at Penn, which is now the Avery um, uh, Art and Architectural Library. It's a beautiful building. If you have a chance to walk inside, you'll get to see it. They've been renovating it. So at any rate, so any other thoughts about what libraries might look like or what we should be doing now in preparation for changes? Are we doing, and let's go back to the more immediate. We're literally, constantly, but literally looking at sort of our directions for the next five years. Should there be any areas that you would suggest as a current user uh, of our services, of the resources, of our physical site or collections that we should be addressing differently? Or are any of you brave enough to say, you know, you don't really need it? Do you agree with the first statement that Papadakis, President Papadakis made, which somehow has, has been absorbed in our culture still here in some areas? And yeah, maybe he's right, you know. It's not that important to have it. Although I think, in fact, that's a misinterpretation of what he meant because he was very engaged in the innovative electronic uh, future of information here. But if we have to give something up, you know, if we don't get enough, what should we do? Should we, should we, some, some days I wake up and say, should we be in the real estate business? You know, we can, we can stay in the online business. Are we really, are librarians, okay, so you appreciate that they're, help, they're here to help you, but are we in the educational business? We like to think we are, but I want to get a sense, do you, do you engage with that? Mike. I don't think it's going to be needed in the form that is the traditional one that we're kind of used to with books in the shelves and facts in the car catalog and all the rest. But it's going to be necessary, I think, for a couple of reasons. I teach and I was a PhD student here myself. And I went to the Penn Library because the Drexel Library didn't have the stuff I needed for my work. Um, and I felt bad about that, but I got help there and I get help here. Jay's a integral part of my engineering class. So I think in the future, there's so much information and there's so many vehicles with which we can get the information and so many sources that we think because we can do Google, we know how to get what we need. And because this has emerged and that's emerged, something else is coming down the pipe. And we have all these devices and all these instantaneous access to everything we possibly want. We don't have the time to keep up with all that. But there are people like Jay my 
dorm in 1970, you couldn't study at all because there were strange things going on in the <laughs> late 60s, early 70s, and um, you, didn't, you had to find a safe place. You had to find a quiet place. But today, it's more than that. It's a place to do research. It's a place to get help. It's a place where stuff has already been vetted because they're not buying everything. They're buying the things that the professors say that they need for the classes. So some of the legwork, I believe, is Thank you. <laughs> In all transparency, this is one of our stellar ex officio members of our advisory committee and, and uh, active in IT, but a great partner in working on stuff. Any other thoughts about it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I at times think of when we speak about the library, you know, we're one of the f only professions, with several of us in the field think about this, that is named after a place. You know, you don't think of teachers as classroom exitionists <laughs> or lawyers, court courtists or something. Um, and I think part of it is to, I, I sometimes think the library is really a state of mind. It's a metaphor for, if we talk about space, it's not that you're going to a physical space. And even now, it's not just being in the cyberspace, but it's, it's your own environment. And a lot of what we're shifting to now is not just to be there to help you. We're not, we still will do that, and we're still very service-oriented, but our nature of our services try to get you to be self-directed and your ability to be able to do some of this yourself. And that distinguishes you over other people who haven't had this kind of higher education. Uh, but it's, it's deeply important in our society, as a lot of the current topics can tell us, to be able to understand what, what are you making decisions on? What is the facts? What are the currents? And just not believe everything you, you hear or see. So any last minute uh, advice to us, or comments, or thoughts? Now's your chance. Yeah, Eric. Uh, I, mean, I have a question for you. Are you uh -oh. the library the space? Yeah, I'm Eric Gomer. I'm the director of athletics. I'm also a professor of psychology. I've been here for 21 years at Western University. And you know, I use the library. I used it this month. I used it because a book was published, and I felt they plagiarized the entire chapter from mm -hmm. my book. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's always an interesting question because you, to build something, it's also restricted by what, what resource you have to do it. So if I was limitless in that sense, um, I would probably say that one of the key things is recognizing what sort of a nascent field now that involves a lot of um, disciplines is how do people learn and what in an environment contributes to becoming a learner. So in thinking about the library space, we're, you know, just for advocacy, we're trying to say, you know, it's not just a place to study. It's rather a place to become something. And the becoming is that you are independent, self-directed, and you truly are a lifelong learner. So we're helping you figure out how to deal with information, how to find it, how to evaluate it, how to sort out all the stuff that's out there, the good and the bad. And the good and bad is not necessarily dictated by someone else, it's by how relevant it is to you. So clearly we have things that can stimulate that. And interestingly, um, and as I was saying, there's sort of a nascent field, but psychologists are involved in it, learning scientists are involved in it, information scientists, architects, planners. There's a, there's a sort of growing group of folks that are asking this question, what in a learning environment contributes to learning? And one of the things that we definitely used in the last renovation is light, natural light. And if you look at the building in Hagerty, you know, we have that nice atrium there. Everybody fills those seats real quick. Everybody takes those seats, and, and you have told us year in and year out, they want places to be able to focus. You, it's, it's not enough to be in a nice Starbucks or even a nice reading lounge where everybody can talk. You don't want the distractions. So from a lot of these different interests, there's been a number of characteristics of behaviors that come out. And the three that keep consistently rising is they have a place to learn alone in solitude, that you are having that relationship with materials. So our second floor, that new area that faces uh, the gym, <laughs> We debated whether to put bicycles in there, but um, it, it, it was designed with the idea to make sure you have more places to, to be yourself and work, have just the relationship with information. But the second is studying with others and the, and the social activity of learning. So we need places to have larger spaces and now all sorts of technologies that, that stimulate and enable people to have collaborations. So as you see screens, we're going to be doing some new stuff, we introduced the visualization zone, so to make it easier for you to see how to bring data together, the, that next unit of information and get insights. And then the third is, and that many of you have stated to us in different ways, you don't know quite what it is, but there's something about the ambiance of a library that you want to preserve. And those who have studied this have been saying, it's it, the term that comes up is you study along. You're studying in the company of others. You're not, you know, you might be in a small room, a study room, and there might be six of you working there. You're not working on the same project, maybe, but it's just knowing that you're in an environment and it's okay to study. So having, I'm, I'm not an architect, you know, I have some ideas of what looks nicer. Color has some impact, light has some impact, um, amount of physical space, and I think we're packed in too much in that library, but it's very true. We have a design right now that the main objective was get more seats in there. Um, we could add 250 seats in that building without changing the footprint. But I'm wondering, is that really, unless they're all, you know, clearly working out, it may not be the best use of that space. You're, the two guys sitting there, you're sort of agreeing. So what nerve am I hitting? What, what is a similar sentence? Well, thank you very much. I think our time is up, so um, I encourage you to stop in, talk to me, and also, you know, we have a whole handful of liaisons, three of whom are here, uh, that are not only experts in information and uh, how to navigate it, but in your discipline to know how your uh, educational needs and your research needs are there. So thanks so much for engaging with us. Thanks very much. Thank